Oh, thanks, Tom. Praise God. So let's get into the word today. Amen. We need the word of God. It's, it's what speaks to our lives. And so today I'm going to be speaking a message uh, called. Uh, hold on, I can tell you what it's called in a minute. You know, it's behind me, right? Yes. One step away. Thank you. Thank, thank you. There it is. One step away. I was like, oh, or, or just or just a step away. Amen. Praise God. Um, I don't worry about the titles as much as I do about getting the material into my mind. So let's pray. Father, what a joy it is to be back with the family live, God, and to be exp experiencing what you do in our lives. Jesus, we just uh, pray. Uh, could we break this for a minute? Uh, there were some things I wanted to do and I totally had forgotten. And so, Pastor Rick, I'm going to ask you to come up here. We want to anoint you with oil and pray for you today. Uh, Pastor Rick's been going through some things in his body. Uh, I won't share what those things are, but uh, he's believing God. And we believe that God is walking with him and doing things in his life. And so if there's some men that would like to gather around the brother and, and lay hands on him today, we're going to anoint him with oil and pray for him and just believe for healing in his body today. Amen. Praise God. I'm glad the Lord brought that back to my remembrance. Amen. In Jesus' name. Father God, we believe today that you are the healer. We thank you for the stripes that were set upon your back. We pray over this body today, and I just ask God that, first of all, my brother would be at total peace through the situation that he faces today. Total peace, God, because he knows that your hand is involved in this. He knows what you will do and what you can do, and he knows that his faith is firmly founded in the word, in your word, God. He teaches your word. He preaches your word. He lives your word. And so, God, let that word be evident in every part of his life today. God, we pray for the healing of this flesh today, God. We pray that you would line this body up with your word and that everything that has happened and brought him to this place today, God, would be made whole, Jesus. We just pray for your healing power. We pray for your healing grace. We pray for your strength. And we believe for a good report, Father, with the test that he's going through, Jesus. And just ask for your, for your mercy and your kindness and your strength and your glory and your power and your healing and all that you are, Father, just to be evident in his life as he walks through this today. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Praise God. Bless you. You're welcome. I would also like to pray for one more person today. I know we didn't have a time of prayer today. Uh, I went to the hospital yesterday to see uh, Sister Maria Mercado, who sits over here usually. She is in the hospital with uh, blood clots again in her lung. Uh, one uh, that's been formed and another that's forming. Uh, these are, the doctors tell her that these are a, a, a symptom of the COVID that she had way back uh, when probably, I don't know what month she had it way back when, but, uh, but we want to pray for her. Amen. God is good. She trusts in him. Uh, she believes and she knows that God is able to do these things. So could we pray for Sister Maria today? Uh, she's in, she's in, in spirit uh, over in Violin if anybody wants to make contact with her. So I think it's room 271, but don't take that as gospel because I'm not sure. Well, it wouldn't be gospel anyway because Jesus didn't say it. Don't take it as uh, factual until you find out. So, amen. I don't want to ever put my words with Jesus' words. Amen. So, Father, we just uplift our sister Maria today. I don't know if she's watching online or, or, you know, what's going on in her life today, God. But I thank you for the care that she's getting. And we pray, God, that these medications would continue to work. But more than that, that your hand would move. Lord, and her body that seems to create these blood clots so easily, God, that this would stop, Father, Lord. I don't understand it all. I don't know it all. But, Lord, I know that you're able to change blood and do things and, and heal that body. And so right now, Father, we just come against those blood clots. We pray that they'd be broken, that they would not pass through any other parts of the body, God. And we pray that that body would stop making those clots, God, and stop doing what it's doing to uh, bring this danger into her life today, God. Thank you for her faith in you. Thank you for her trust in you. Thank you for her walk with you, God. Lord, let that faith be uh, admonished today in your healing in her life, Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now let's pray for the word. So, Father, I put myself in your place today I, uh, or behind you today. I ask that you would take your place today. I ask that you would be in the forefront. I ask that you would speak to us, that you would challenge us, that you would grow us up, that you would make us your disciples, that this word would change us and, and work in us, God, the things that need to be worked in us, God. And so, Lord, just have your way. Lord, Holy Spirit, we pray for your anointing. We pray for your power to bring revelation into our lives. And pray that this word, as it is open today, would just manifest itself in our lives and change us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Praise God. 
So getting back to it, let's get back to it. Why am I getting back to it? Because last week, even though I wasn't with you, I was with you or I wasn't with you. I don't know what it was. It was live. All right. So it wasn't pre-recorded. And when Marcus uh, and Bombi asked me to oversee that service for their commissioning into the ministry at this new church. And let me tell you what a church they're in. And we're excited about this for them. And uh, we're just excited about where God has them, this couple. Uh, when they asked me, I knew that I would be on vacation the week before. And then I, and I'm like, oh God, I, I really don't like to be out of the pulpit like that. And so help me uh, formulate something in my heart uh, to be able to be and, and give me a message it would be for both churches. And so I pray, I know it was effective there. I know that it touched people's hearts there. I know that it was timely there. I pray that it was just as timely here. And I pray that as you joined us live uh, in that service up in Allentown, outside of Allentown, up in Lehigh Valley last week, that, that you were truly blessed. Um, so we took a break that week from our Strong in the Storm series, and now I want to get back to it. So let's get back to it. Because I really believe that if you're reading with us, and if you didn't get a book, we still have them, but I really believe if you're reading with us, I believe that you're hearing something and God is shaking something in your heart and God is speaking to you in things about our church uh, in amazing ways. I really believe that. And if, if not, please let me know. Maybe I've missed it, but I pray that I haven't. And um, oh, I'm just gonna do that anyway. Excuse me for a second, okay. So, Here's what's happening as I read it. Here's what I think is happening as I, as I read this book every week. I sense that God is awakening the abundant living church to the day that we are living in. And I said it last week. We talked about the men of Issachar who understood the times that they were living in. I sense that God is doing something. I'm not in your heart, in my heart as the pastor here. Uh, and God is speaking to us about how we take our place in the day that we're living. And so I believe that. And I also sense, secondly that God is speaking to us, confirming his plan for us, for our lives, for our church, for our communities, and what he has called us to in that community. And when I say our community, I speak a little differently that to this church than I do to some other churches because our community is not the local community. You guys come from all over the place. And so wherever you come from, that's the community. And it's amazing to me that this church has the ability to reach that community as well as this community because that's where you come from. God would not have added you to this church so far away from your home that you drive to and that you come to if it wasn't for this church to be able to touch the community where you live. And so I don't know how God does all that and I pray about that all the time, but I know that God is at work. And so here's what we've talked about so far. We want to be the church that God wants us and that God created us to be, amen? That's where we're headed with this. A church with Christ at the center of everything that we do. Christ is at the center of our worship. Christ is at the center of our prayer meetings. Christ is at the center of every gathering that we have, our men's group, our women's group, our Awana, our youth group. And Christ is at the center of um, our lives so that we can bring, make him the center of the world that we're in. It's a church not playing the religious game, but a church that is totally in love with Jesus. We want to be a church that is being effective in ministering to those who need help all around us. We want to be a church full of people who really know what they believe and whom they believe in. There are some people sitting in churches today that don't even know the God whom they believe in. They sang songs today and don't know him, are, are distanced from him, and, are, uh, and don't understand who he really wants to be in their lives. I don't want to be that church today. Um, and we know how to fight and win the battle that the enemy brings against us every time and win. Amen. Not just to fight but we know how to win, we know how to overcome, we know how to take advantage of what God has given to us and see the enemy defeated. A church without hesitation in the movings of the Holy Spirit in our midst. So when God wants to move in this place and the Holy Spirit wants to move, that we wouldn't be hesitant about that, we wouldn't be afraid of it, we wouldn't back away from it, but we would say, God, whatever you have for us, whatever you wanna do in our midst today, God, be free to do it, have your way in it. There'd be no confusion or fear when God chooses to move. And we desire the move of God every time we meet. Amen? We said a church that is built by God. A church that is equipped by God. A church that is empowered by God. A church that is spirit-filled with empowered men, with spirit-filled ministries and ministers. A church uh, with spirit uh, that the Holy Spirit is impacted and anointed and has, a wor has anointed word and has anointed actions. I want to this year, this October 2nd, when we go out to that field and we uh, wait and serve on our community, uh, I want to really have the community sense that there's a move of the Spirit. They may not understand it, they may not know it, but the way that we serve them and wait on them, there's something that's gonna register in their hearts. Uh, this event is geared a little different than some of our other events. Most of our other events at this point, 
are geared to just bring people to the ground. This event is going to be geared to present the gospel totally. And so the bands and the people that will be singing on the stage, the ones who are giving their testimonies, the ones who are offering a, uh, a, uh, a, a chance of salvation, they're going to be ministering. They're not going to be entertaining. We don't want entertainers up on that stage. We want ministry. We want people to be ministered to. We want the word of God to go forth. And so pray for these ones that this group is getting together to come and to minister. Uh, pray for yourself and seek God for yourself because you're going to be here hopefully helping us and being a part of what God's doing and that's always a great thing but we want your actions to be spirit uh, impacted and anointed amen we said a church that is praying a church that is praying fervently actually my brother said that that was the message that he brought to us and a church that is seeing results a church that is being effective because we are spending time with God amen because God is working in us and what he's done in us will then be done through us amen it's not enough just for God to do in us we're going to talk about that today we need God to do through us and then we said a church that has a passionate concern about what is important to the kingdom of heaven. This was the message I recorded, uh, that we have God's heart for this world and that we have God's heart for the people and time. Why do we need God's heart for time? Because time is coming to a close, folks. Time is getting short. If you don't sense that in your heart, something's wrong, you're missing something. Jesus' return is very soon. There's no doubt about it in my heart. I've not spoken that for a lot of years because it just was not, I didn't feel that it was just, uh, not that I wanted to get away from it, but I, there's something in my heart that is stirring to preach it again and to let people know time is short, Jesus is coming, and we better be about, I'm not saying get right. You need to do that on your own. I'm saying we need to help, we need to serve others. We need to wait on others because there's a harvest that must be brought in. We're going to talk about that in today's message today. And then finally, a church that is leading people to Christ. And that is where I want to pick it all up today. Uh, and let me say it this way. This is the one thing that I picked from the chapter that we read this, year, this week. Brothers and sisters, church family, abundant living church, whatever you want me to call you today, parishioners, attenders, uh, I just prefer brothers and sisters. We don't belong here. Let me say that again. We don't belong here. That's what I picked up from our reading this week. If you read chapter 7 this week, you know what I'm talking about. If you didn't read, uh, is, it, is it seven or eight? It's seven, right? If you read chapter seven this week, you know what I'm talking about. If you didn't read the chapter this week or you're not reading the book, here's what Jesus says in his prayer for his disciples. I think you'll understand what I'm talking about. John 17, 14 to 16. Listen to what Jesus says. He's praying for his disciples. He's praying for his church. Here's what he says. I have given them, he's talking to his father. I have given them your word and the world has hated them because they are not of the world just as I am not of the world. I do not pray that you should take them out of the world, but that you should keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. And so hopefully as you see Jesus' words here, you hear what I'm saying when I say, brothers and sisters, we don't belong here. We are not of this world. He, he prays, Father, keep them in the world. Don't take them out. Keep them in the world, but just like I am, let them realize that they are not of the world. And you've heard it said, in the world, but not of it, right? That's what you hear a lot of Christians say. Well, we're in the world, but not of it. This is where that comes from. This is where that sentiment comes from. This is where that expression comes from. In the world, not of it. We don't belong here. At the end of his song, Reader's Digest, a, 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 a fellow who I used to listen to many, many years ago and still listen to his music almost every day. Larry Norman, he's dead, he died at 60, uh, went to be with Jesus. But in one of his songs, Reader's Digest, he ends the song with this. This world is not my home. I'm just passing through. We don't belong here. And so that is the thought that I want to focus on today because the thought is right. And I want you to know sometimes the way it's preached and sometimes the way the church sees it, it's also wrong. How can a thought of God be right and be wrong? It's the way that we look at it. It's the way that we see it. It's the way that we um, mentalize it and the way that we process it. So let's get into this. Bethsaida, the woman in the book, in this book, uh, this past week, she's sitting in a nightclub in New York City. 
She's left the church. She grew up in the Brooklyn Tabernacle. She left the church to seek her own life. She had a father who loved Jesus, still served in the church. But because of the way that he loved her, she didn't recognize it as love. And so she went out into the world looking for the love of a man. And she says, men, okay? And so she ends up in these nightclubs with her friends and she ends up in this place. And she's looking around this nightclub when she hears the voice of God say these words to her. You don't belong here. I have been in places where I, you know, I, I've been, I've been, I, I, I got to tell you, it's not that I go to places where I don't belong. I have been in movie theaters, okay, where I'm watching a movie. Sometimes I'm with people and sometimes I'm not. Uh, and I was really surprised that the person I was with the one time went to this movie. Um, I, didn't under, I didn't know it, but I'm sorry, I shouldn't be surprised that they went. I was surprised that they stayed, okay. So I'm watching a movie and all of a sudden the words come forth. I got up and left. I don't belong there. I will not watch a movie. I will not watch a rated R movie. I will not allow it in my home. I will not go to theaters to watch it because I don't belong there as a child of God. And so I got up. I remember getting up out of that movie theater and I was really surprised that those people, that those people stayed. And um, just, it really, it really blew my mind. But that's okay. That's another day. They've got to deal with it, not me. I did what I knew I needed to. I got up and I walked out. And so, but say that she's sitting in this club in New York City at night. She says she sees people stoned on drugs, people drunk out of their minds, gyrating in the dance floor and all this other stuff. And the Holy Spirit very clearly speaks to her and says, you don't belong here. Listen, church, I think that more Christians need to begin to hear the voice of God say these words to them. I think we block them out. I think we try to uh, disguise them and say, ah, that wasn't God. That was just my own thinking. And God, I believe, is speaking to his church and saying, listen, Time is short, church. Time is short, brother and sister. You don't belong there. You are not a part of this anymore. I feel like we are so mixed up with the world and the church. And many times people never see the difference that there should be between the church and the world. Your friends should see a difference in you. Your co-workers should see a difference in you. The people that you do life with should see a difference in you. I'm not saying it's, it's a difference that's going to uh, embarrass them, but it should be a difference that provokes something in them. It should be a difference that makes them want what you have. They should understand that there's a difference. How many know that's a problem today in the church, amen? There's not a big difference between the church and the world. In John 15, 19, Jesus says, if you were of the world, the world would love you because the world loves its own. Yet because you are not of the world, because I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. I think that's the problem. We don't want the world to hate us. I think the problem is we want to be accepted. We want to be loved. And, you know, so we don't want the world to hate us. But, folks, Jesus is very clear here. The world's going to hate you. The world is not going to love you hanging around sometimes because they understand that there's a difference in you or they should see a difference in you. And so what Jesus is saying here is that even though we are in this world, we live in this world. I was born in the flesh, right? I have a mother who gave birth to me. So I was born as any other child on this earth besides Jesus. Well, he was born that way too, but he didn't have a father. His father was the Holy Spirit. That's what I mean. All right. So I was born like every other child on this earth. I was born into this world. Okay. But when I gave my heart to Jesus at the age of six, I entered into another world. I became the citizen of another kingdom and no longer do I belong to this world because someday I'm going to be lifted out of this world, whether by death or by um, resurrection or by um, rapture. Thank you, Glenn. Either by death or rapture, I'm going to be lifted out of this world and taken to the things of heaven. Okay. So think about that. Our true home is in heaven. And church, our hearts should long and our hearts should look forward to being in heaven and being with God. That doesn't mean that the things in this world don't affect us. Don't get me wrong. I'm not saying, hey, as a Christian, you're not going to be affected by anything in this world. <laughs> a lot of us in this building today have had COVID. We were affected by it, right? Praise God, it wasn't as bad of an effect as some other people had with it. And you're still sitting here today. But we had it. We were affected by it. Uh, we've been affected by flus. We've been affected by viruses. We've been affected by accidents and, and by taxes, right? And, and, by, and by all of this other stuff. We're still affected by the things of this world. There are many bad things in this world. There are many points of suffering in this world. And all Christians face them in the world. But praise God, in the midst of them, the things that makes the difference is we have a future and a hope. Amen? We have a place that we are going to. We have a place that we belong to. And praise God, this is not it. This is not all. So let's not make it the all. 
That's the problem. The church likes to make this the all. I spoke a message. It's probably not online because I don't even know if I could find it. It's probably on VHS. That's how long ago I spoke this message. And this message, if you remember it, I'm not even sure I was the pastor at the time, maybe newly the pastor. I spoke about putting tent pegs down of, of where we were and just saying, this is where we're settling now. And I think I used Abraham's story where God called Abram out of his land to a place that he would lead him to. And, you know, every night when Abram and his family came to a place, they would put the tent post in. But you know what? It wasn't the place that God had for them. So every morning they had to pull the tent post up. And I think what happens is we get a little happy. This is what that, that message was about. We get a little happy sometime with a little bit of what God gives us. And we just slam the tent post in and we never pull them back out because we're so happy. But we miss what God has for us. We miss, I don't even know if I could find the notes for that. Maybe that's, maybe that's speakable again. I don't speak, I don't re-speak many messages. I think I've spoken three in 33 years of ministry, but I try not to go back to old messages. I try to bring what God speaks to me for today. But what I'm saying is this, we have a future and a hope in the midst of everything that we face. Should we die today, we're gonna be with Jesus. Absent from the body, present with the Lord, amen? Because he is our savior and he is our hope. And that's why Jesus warned us in 1 John 2, 15 to 17, do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, and if you know anything about Jesus' temptations, that the enemy brought against him, Jesus was tempted in every way that we are tempted. These are the three temptations that Jesus faced, right? The lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life, okay? Those are the three things Jesus was tempted in. They are the ways that each and every one of us are tempted. Every temptation fits into these three categories, and Jesus showed us that we can overcome them, okay? That is not of the Father, but it is of the world. Verse 17, and the world is passing away and the lust of it. In other words, the lust of it is passing away too. But he who does the will of God abides forever. So let me bring this to light. Let me get to you what I'm speaking today. Being not of this world means that we are dead to this world. Does that make sense? We're going to read Paul about what Paul says about that in just a second. In other words, we're dead to the world. We should not love the things of this world. When I do a funeral, whether I have a casket or whether I have a, uh, a ashes in an urn, there's one thing that is so true, and I don't mean to make little of anybody who has died, okay? But the truth of it is this, those ashes or that body in that casket no longer long for the things of this world. There's nothing that means anything to them. Everything they've left behind is forgotten. They are in eternity. Wherever they're at in eternity, they're in eternity, but they are in eternity. We should not allow ourselves to be conformed to this world. For all of these things, the Bible says, are temporary. Now, they do bring joy sometimes, don't they? They do bring fulfillment sometimes, and they might even bring satisfaction sometimes. But if you've lived life long enough, you have discovered that that joy and that fulfillment and that satisfaction of the things of this world is what? Temporal. Because someday you wake up and somebody's stolen it. Someday you wake up and it's broken. Someday you wake up and it's just not there. It's no longer, it's not as nice as it used to be. It's not doing what it was supposed to do. We have all been there, whether it's relationships, whether it's devices, whether it's uh, things that we own, whatever it might be, we have all discovered that that joy, fulfillment, and satisfaction goes away as well. And that's what he says here. He says this world is temporal and so is the lust of it. And so, how many have found something that you really, really enjoyed to do in life, but the Lord said, give it up, and all of a sudden it's like, wow, that was, that really, I haven't missed it a whole lot. I thought, man, that would be hard to do. I thought it would be hard to give up, but I haven't missed it a whole lot. You know why? Because God is replacing the lust of the earth with the, I don't want to say lust for him, but with a love for him. Amen. With a devotion to him. And so what Jesus is saying here, church, is this. Listen, stop trying to fit in, and we all do it. As I was writing this message, I'm like, okay, God, yeah, you're speaking to me. I've tried to fit in here. I've tried to fit in there. I've tried to be a part of it here. Stop acting like the people of this world act. And Jesus says, begin to act like me. Stop it. Just stop it. And come on, we all, we all want to fit in. We all want to be a part. We all want to be a big picture. You know, I, I'm, I'm very fortunate. My, fr my friend could tell you this. I'm very fortunate because we grew up together. I, I, I might have shared this before in the church. Whether you believe it or not, I believe it. Soft teeth. I, I don't know. I was always told I had soft teeth. 
So I could never hold a cavity, or I'm sorry, I could never hold a filling or they just fell out. And so uh, I had very, very bad teeth uh, growing up. I was in a lot of pain. At one time the d dentist looked at me and said, you know, you have like six abscess teeth in your mouth. And I was living life that way. What I didn't realize was the poison that was going through my body. I didn't know about that, but uh, you know, it wasn't that my parents didn't try to get the help. I, I, I was scared to death of the dentist. I literally would pull cabinet doors off in dentist's office and you know, try, as they're carrying me into the, uh, uh, just, I was scared to death of them. I would tell you that years ago, I remember his name. I remember where it was at. Uh, this doctor was working on my, this dentist was working in my mouth and I know that I woke up. Now he said I didn't wake up and my parents, I don't think they believe that I woke up and I'm not putting, I'm not faulting that on them, but I know I woke up and that traumatized me. This guy is working in my mouth. He had knocked me out and I have, and I came too. And I just believe that from, that carried something in my life that just, so I lived with these teeth. Can I tell you that there was a blessing in that? And you know what that blessing was? I never got invited to the parties. I never got invited to the in crowd because I didn't fit in, you know, Kenny is a kid from Collins Lakes. Collins Lakes wasn't liked that well by the Buna kids anyway. So, you know, you, you were already a deficit if you grew up in Collins Lakes. And I wasn't in the in crowd. So I didn't have, this was my only friend really growing up. And uh, I didn't have to hang around with other people. I didn't have to be part of the parties. I didn't have to be part of the things that were going, I heard about them. And I want to say there was something in me. I said, boy, I'd like to be invited to that, even though I knew my parents would never let me go. But I want to fit in. But you know what? That kept me from fitting in. I'm so thankful for that today. Because I never, I never have taken a drink. Uh, if I did, it was non-alcoholic beer. And I'll tell you what, I spewed that out of my mouth very quickly and said, how do people drink this stuff? I've never smoked a cigarette. Uh, I've, never, I've never tried marijuana. Uh, you say, well, Pastor, you're at a deficit in life. I don't know. I see it as a blessing. And I tease people that when, uh, if they're drinking, I'll say to them, yeah, just give me a smell of the bottle cap and I'll be under the table. You know what I'm saying? So, but, uh, you know, and I, I'm not, I don't put you down for that. If you do, I'm not saying that. The word of God is very clear in what we can do and what we can't do. What I'm saying is that those bad teeth kept me from being a part of the world. And I, I'm amazed at that today and loving Jesus for that today. Did Jesus give me bad teeth? No. Did he use that in my life? Yes. And I'm thankful for that. So we understand that we don't belong here. And yet Jesus prayed and asked the father to the church. Listen, the believer in the world, he said, keep them here, right? That's what he says. Why? Because my second point today is this. We are needed here. We are needed here. So we don't belong here, but we're needed here. Too many Christians hear this teaching about not belonging here and they check out. We tend to separate ourselves from the world. And Jesus says, you can't do that. But remember, Jesus prayed that we would remain in it. Father, they're not of the world, but don't take them out of the world yet. Keep them in it. We want to protect ourselves. We want to protect our families from the sin and the brokenness of the world. We find that it's easier to live God's standards in life if we remove ourselves from the influence of the world. And that's true. But unfortunately, that creates a problem. When we remove ourselves from the world, we remove the influence of Christ and his word from the world too. Does that make sense? See what I'm saying? We have to come to a place, and this is done by the Holy Spirit Church, where we recognize we don't belong here, but where we recognize even though we don't belong here and don't enter in, that we have to be a part of the world because we minister the love and the peace and the love of God in this world, the power of God in this world. And so that's a problem. This is why Jesus prayed for the Father to keep us in the world. It has two meanings, not to take us out of it and to keep us in victory as we walked through the world. Does that make sense? So Father, keep them in the world. Don't take them out. Father, keep them in the world. Give them the power to overcome the things of this world as they live in it and as they minister in it so that they can be effective. Or too many Christians think that living by God's standards is too hard in this world from the start and they begin compromising with the world. We've seen this in the church. We launch out into the world and begin to be overtaken by the waves of humanity and the waves of sin. And soon, little by little, the compromises take place. Oh, pastor, you can't speak that in the world we live in today. Hogwash, if it's in the Bible, I'm speaking it. Yeah, but pastor, you can't say it in those terms. Oh, no, you can't. But pastor, you know, it's a different world. I get that. But God's word hasn't changed. God hasn't changed. His principles haven't changed. His love for humanity haven't changed. His, his, his expectation of humanity hasn't changed. Many times we don't see that it's happening, this compromise. Or maybe we feel that to minister in this world, we need to be relevant 
which then causes us to compromise many of God's holy standards to do. Well, I need to be relevant. Yeah, well, see, I need to, I need to be relevant to them, Pastor, because I need to minister to them. I, I, I need to be like them. And I get that Paul said, when the Romans, you're with Rome, and, you know, when you're in, when you're in Rome, you're, you act like a Roman. And when you're, but what Paul was saying was this, be godly first. Paul always meant be godly first. He meant don't give up your godliness to be a Roman. Don't give up your godliness to be this. He was saying in the midst of being godly, minister to them. The same thing Jesus says here when he says, Father, don't take them out of the world, but leave them in it. Jesus understood that the church was needed in the world because there would be people in our world. There would be people in our workplaces. There would be people in our homes. There would be people in our communities. There would be people in our schools, in our stores, in our bowling alleys, and even in the Walmart and McDonald's, imagine that, who are part of this world but want to know the healing of it, that want to know the peace in the midst of life, that want to know the fullness of life because they're not living in the fullness of life. So to be in the world means to be involved in the world, not to be a part of it, but to be involved in it. We aren't called to just sit in a pew in our living room 24 hours a day and listen to Kayla all day or listen to televangelists all day. You see, this is where COVID has messed the church up. And I'm a little mad at that, but there's nothing you can do about it because people are people and they need to come around at their own pace. And I get that. But the church, this COVID thing, has, the enemy has used it. Because now we have people that are sitting in their seats every day. They can listen to the word whenever they want. They can listen to every pastor in the world if they want. And they're so inundated by the word of God, but they're doing nothing on the outside. Because they're just comfortable and because they're scared and because of all these other things that are going on. And really what the enemy did with COVID is he used it to, to, to stop the church from moving forward. But thank God. I believe God's going to excite the church again. I believe God's going to empower the church again. And I believe God's going to continue to move the church forward. Listen, we are all called to be Christ in this world. Amen? You are Christ where you work. You are called to be Christ where you live. You are called to be Christ in your neighborhood. You are called to be Christ where you bowl, where you throw darts, where you quilt, where you do whatever you do. You are called to be Christ. We need to be involved in our societies. Matthew 28, 19, and 20, we know it. It's the Great Commission. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. Jesus said, go, not to wait for them to come. It is exciting to me that our church has grown during COVID. It is exciting to me that our church has grown during this summer. We never see growth in the summer, but we have new faces if you're not looking around. And if you haven't been here, you're, you're missing out on some of the new faces that are here even this summer. That's a great thing. Why? Because you are going. You are telling people. You are inviting people. I would like to introduce you a friend of mine, Anthony, um, help me, M. Malazzo. Thank you. I was going to say Mazzioli, and I knew that wasn't it. Anthony Malazzo, who I've just gotten to meet this week and who I met over at the uh, night out, the, the national night out. And he and I are getting together and I've invited him out to men's group because I, you know, and I'm just, I'm believing great things for this young man. And so get to know him today. I believe he's going to be around a little bit. I think this is a God ordained moment for me and Anthony and our relationship and what God's going to do. I don't know him. We're just getting to know one another. He's been calling me. We've been talking and who knows what God's going to do in this. Amen. But you see, you're going, you're inviting people. You're telling people come. And you know what? Some of you are surprised because guess what? They're coming. Praise God for that. In the midst of COVID, people are coming to church. Our church grew during COVID. In the midst of the summer crowd, people are coming. Yeah, they are because you're doing something. You're going out. You're going forward. We can't wait for them to come anymore. Have you known that? Albert and Albert, it's so good to see you guys, man. Praise God. It's so good to see you. I knew I knew you, and I'm thinking, oh, come on. Albert and Albert, praise God. Medina, amen. Acts 1.8, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you shall be witness to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. Do you get that? Jesus gave us the Holy Spirit church so that we could go. Jesus gave us the Holy Spirit so that we could witness. And there are Christians sitting in church today saying, well, I don't know what to say. You don't know what to say sometimes. Trust the Holy Spirit. I wish I could tell you as a pastor for 33 years, as a student of the Bible constantly, I wish I could tell you that I walk into every situation every day and just know what to say. Nope. There are times when I have to shut up sometimes, just say, okay, Holy Spirit, I need your help right now. I don't know what to say in this situation. I don't know how to direct this person, but I believe that you do. 
I was driving uh, Wednesday in my car. I was going to the bank to make the deposits and the Lord gave me a word for Anthony. And the word for Anthony was, you need to come to men's group. The Lord said, invite him to men's group. So I said to him, Aunt, I said, you, I said, you got to uh, come to men's group. And uh, so hopefully he'll be there next Monday. I'm not putting that on him. I would never try to manipulate somebody or put that on him. That's his free will. But I pray that he comes out. Amen. <laughs> Plant a seed. Amen. He gave us the Holy Spirit so that we could have the power to maintain our Christian walk in the darkness of this world. Can somebody say amen? amen. Remember the message a few weeks ago, Matthew 5, 16. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. So in this walk with the Lord, in the work that he has laid upon our hearts, church, we have to be mindful. But listen, this is where the message title came from. That we are always just one step away from the thoughts and the systems and the brokenness of this world. Always. Because we're in the world, but not of it. It's just one step. One step to the left or one step to the right determines where we are with this world and where we are with God. We have to be mindful of that. We must be free of this world's influence and yet be involved in its systems so that we can be an example for those around us. In the reading, I saw three questions that Bethsaida had to answer in her own life that we need to answer as well. Three questions that will help us estimate just how close we are to the world and just how far we are from God or vice versa and how we might correct where we are. Three questions that we need to answer to walk the fine line of not being in the world, but living in it, okay? Not being of it, but living in it and being of God. Number one, you can write them down if you want. I'll go through them quickly. What are you consumed with? This was the one question that she did ask. The other questions you may not have heard, but I felt the Holy Spirit quicken them to me. Number one, what are you consumed with? I think that we may have covered this in the message a few weeks ago or months ago when we talked about Jesus being the center of our life. But I want to touch on it a little bit. What are you consumed with? For many people in the church, for many people in the world, you know what we're consumed with? Ourselves. Ourselves. They won't come to church unless they're going to get something out of it. Well, I don't like that church anymore because it just, I don't get anything out of it. Well, it's not for you to get something out of, amen? It's for God to do something in our lives. They won't commit to a ministry in the church unless their lives are enhanced by it. Well, will I be out front? Will people see me? <laughs> you know? Uh, no, probably not in some of the ministries we have. But we need people to minister in those situations and in those places. They can't give to God financially. They can't give to God time-wise. They won't sacrifice anything for God because it's me, me, me. But remember what the Apostle Paul, and I told you we'd get to this verse today. Remember what the Apostle Paul had to say about me, me, me. Romans 6, 1 to 12. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Me, me, me? Certainly not. How shall we who died to sin live any longer in it? Or do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Therefore we were buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in the newness of life. Now we have a night scheduled to go to Ocean City, New Jersey in September because we always go down and we baptize in the ocean. But we're going to do a baptism here. We may not do that service on the beach this year because we're going to do a baptism here because Sean, the young man who just sat there, I don't know where he went, but he just sat there, uh, who gave his heart to the Lord a couple weeks ago, and Brandy, who also wants to be baptized, they've chosen to be baptized in the church. I give them that choice when it comes to this time of the year. We're going to go to the ocean. You can baptize in the ocean or you can be baptized. We want to be baptized here. Fine. So in the next few weeks, we're going to put that together and we're going to baptize them. Anybody, anybody else who would like to be baptized, you can join them, okay? But I want them to know this is what's happening. They are dying to self, going under the water, being buried, dead, and they're rising up with a newness and a refreshing of life. I think we're at verse uh, 5. For if we have been united together in the likeness of his death, certainly we also shall be in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves of sin. For he who has died has been freed from sin. Now if we died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him. Knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, dies no more. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death that he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life that he lives, he lives to God. Likewise, you also... Reckon yourselves to be dead indeed to sin, but alive to God in Christ, Jesus our Lord. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body, that you should obey it in its lusts. What's he saying there? Me is dead. 
Isn't that right? That's what he's saying there. Me is dead. Paul no longer exists. I died. I asked Jesus to come into my heart. I gave all my ambitions. I gave all my anger. I gave all my lust. I gave all my sin, my brokenness, my joys, my possessions. I gave everything to him. I gave it to him. I no longer live to myself. I'm dead. I'm a dead man. You, I spoke a message years ago. Dead man walking. It might be two or three years ago. Dead man walking. You could probably find it online. And what's he saying? He's saying what is consuming you is what will also consume your time, money, and anything else that you give to. You're either being consumed by the flesh or you're being consumed by God. Sean, I just talked about you, but that's okay. I'll fill you in later. Amen. Love that hair, man. And I want to have hair like that when I grow up. What should be consuming us is living for Christ. Come on, church. That's what should be consuming us. Remember, Paul says here, dead to sinful self and alive to Christ. No longer living for self, but living for Christ is another way that he puts it in the scripture. Now, if you're not there yet, church, then don't beat yourself up. Don't let the enemy beat you up. But rather, take this message today and leave this service today and begin to make a change. I'm not there yet, but I want to be. I need to die. I need to die to this thing. I need to die to this anger. I need to die to this addiction. I need to die to this lust. I need to die to this habit. I need to die to this relationship. I need to die to this thing. And I need to die and I need to live in Christ. Start it. Go out and begin to change. Go out and begin to make the subtle changes, the little changes, and the big changes will follow. Can I say that probably most of the problems that we all face today in this world most of those things that frustrate us, most of those things that get us down are caused by the fact that we are so consumed with ourselves in our society today. Can I say that? I believe that to be true. Number two, question number two. What is God asking you to do? Ooh. Remember, according to Jesus' prayer for you as one of his disciples, you are in the world for a reason. Father, don't take them out. Leave them here because they have a task that they need to do. Well, how do I know what that task is, Pastor? Here's how you know. Look at your responsibilities in life. Look at the people that you are in relationship with in life. Look at the places where you hang out in life. Look all around you because God has you right where you belong for his cause in the situations that are all around us every day. Camping. God puts you in a campground because you're to minister to the people around you as you camp. Um, motorcycling. God puts you on a motorcycle because you're to minister around to the motorcyclists around you. Building things with your hand. God puts you there because the businesses that you sell to and the people that you do business with, God wants you to minister to. You're in the health, uh, you're, you're in the health uh, department, and many people in our church are in the health department. Uh, God puts you in that place because you never know when somebody's going to need a prayer. You never know when somebody's going to need a word of wisdom from the Lord in the situation that they're going through. And many of you have stories and accounts of how God used you in that situation. So how do I know, Pastor? How do I know what to do? Just look at where you hang out. In OSL, at every level, we have something called roles and goals. And if you have taken OSL, I hope you have not forgotten about them because they seem to get forgotten, but they should always be something you're developing. And so roles and goals. The role is who you are. As a child of God, who am I? Oh, I'm a husband. So as a Christian husband, what are my goals? Oh, I'm a father. So as a Christian father, what are my... Oh, I'm a pastor. As a pastor, what are my goals? And I begin to take all of my roles that God has placed me in. And I begin to write goals and begin to make sure that I'm fulfilling those things. Some of you need to get back to this because this is powerful. Don't just see it as words on paper, but see it as something in your heart that God wants to do. And begin to fill those goals in and begin to enact. And you know what you're doing? What you're basically doing is saying, Jesus, why am I here? And Jesus, since I'm here in these positions, teach me how to be the godly woman, the godly man that you called me to be. Matthew 9, 35 to 38. Then Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing every sickness and every disease among the people. But when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion for them, because they were weary and scattered like sheep having no shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, The harvest is truly plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. And so we look for the harvest. Listen, we're always looking for the harvest, right? Oh, Jesus, lead me to the harvest. And Jesus says this to his disciples. You're in the harvest. 
You're standing in the middle of the field. They're all around you. I placed you where you, I've given you the job that you're in. I've given you the position you're in. I've given you the family you're in because you are standing in the middle of the field that needs to be hard. It's like we're waiting for the season to come and Jesus is waiting for the season to come. The season's almost over. It's dying on the vine. It's dying on, the, if it's not plucked soon, it's never coming in. Get about business. And what's he say? He says, what are you going to do about it? You know what he says? Pray for the harvesters. Now, here's the funny thing about that prayer. I've spoken a message, so I'm not going to uh, belabor this. But here's the thing that we need to remember. He was telling the disciples to pray for themselves. Here's what we do in the church. Jesus, you know my workplace. You know where I work. You know so-and-so. God, raise up a harvester to go minister to them. And Jesus says, like Matthew, what's his name? West says, I already did. I placed you right there. I brought you into that situation. I gave you a relationship with them. What are you waiting for? So really what Jesus said to the disciples, he was just praying that their eyes would be open. They weren't to pray for other laborers. They were to pray for themselves that they would have a burden to go into the harvest that they were standing in and pull the harvest in. Church, you're right in the middle of the harvest. You're right in the middle of the field. Whether it's at Lowe's, whether it's at uh, the state, whether it's uh, uh, in, at, at the post office, whether it's in the public school system, whether it's in the hospital, whether it's out in the street, whether it's in a hot building, wherever you are, whether it's uh, living life in, uh, like, like where Glenn, Brother Glenn works in a great place. I mean, they, they, that place is hopping, man. I mean, they, they've got all the, he's got all the fresh stuff going on there, man. They, they, they can probably take their toys to work over there. But whether it's there, you're still ministering, amen? Right? You're still ministering. You're called to minister. Don't be jealous of somebody else. Work where you are. God put you there for a reason. I need to close this thing. So we look for the harvest. Relationships, other things like jobs and places you might find yourself are never coincidental. I don't believe in coincidence anymore. I believe God placed us. I believe that Anthony and I ran into each other on that blacktop the other night so that he and I, God, would form a relationship between us. And I believe that Anthony's going to have some great relationships in this church with other men as well as he grows here, if that's where God places him. I don't know if this is the place for him or not. He has to decide that, but that's my prayer. They are God-ordained harvest fields, amen? It's not coincidence. It's God-ordained harvest field. Look at the sign over the door as you walk out every day from this church. If you're in here, look at that sign and remind yourself as you go out that door today that we are entering the harvest field, amen? And number three, what will you do with God's love? This is an important question today, right? We're so concerned about love. We're so concerned about being loved. Will I ever find someone to love? And will I ever find someone who will love me back? Will this person whom I love today continue to love me through the ups and the downs of life? Will I ever be able to love another again after, I, they, after that person did this to me? Valid questions for the day. Valid questions for the society that we're living in. And they seem so very important. Yet they pale in comparison to the love that God has shown to us. Who else has ever given their son so that we didn't have to die? I've never had another person do that for me. Who else has promised that they would never leave us or forsake us? I've seen spouses promise that at the altar, but they don't always follow through. Who else has given us a love that knows no boundaries, a love that can never end? I, my wife tries her hardest, but there's times when she gets frustrated with me. God never gets frustrated with me. He doesn't always like what I do, but he always loves me. Who else has ever loved us when we treated them so badly? Because basically, we have all spit in God's face through the sin of humanity. And still he loved us, Romans 5.8. But God demonstrates his love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. So what will you do with that love, church? What will you do with such love? Will you continue to live for yourself and continue to spit in God's face, a face, a God that loves you with everything? Or will you allow that love to enter into your life today and change you? And then let me ask this, what will you do with that love? Will you sit in a church each week like millions of Christians and sing about that love and thank God for that love and yet not share it with another person that week? In other words, self-consumed, again, even in the love of God. Or will you take it out of these walls today and share it with others? Will you let your coworkers, will you let your family, will you let your friends know that God loves them and that he wants to do good things in their lives and demonstrate God's love to them by the way which you love them in the situations they're in? That's why you are in the world. That's why Jesus said to be a part of the world, not of the world, but in it. Did I say that right? You know what I meant. 
That's why we're here. But we cannot love people in the world truly like God loved us and loves them if we are of the world. We'll never be able to love them with God's love. My brothers and sisters, we do not belong here. But we are here to make a difference. Amen? Let's pray. Father God, I ask you to minister this word to our hearts today. Lord, I believe that I've delivered that what you have given to me. I hope that I have not sidetracked in ways that I didn't need to, God. And I pray, God, that this word has cut us to the heart today, God. I pray, Lord, that we would think about life differently. I pray, God, that we would look at life differently. And I pray, God, that we would say things and do things that would cause death in our lives to the things of this world and life in you. God, help us. You have placed us in harvest fields in every moment of life. Forgive us where we've not taken advantage of those things. Forgive us where we've not been the people that you've called us to be, where we've not loved like you love, where we've not forgiven like you have, where we've not cared for the way you care for. Help us, God. Make us the church that you're calling us to be this summer through this series. God, do something in our lives to wake us up. Do something to get us back on our feet. Do something to shake us and to wake us, God, and to bring us to the place that you have for us, God. Lord, I ask for my brothers and sisters and myself today, here in this house and also online, God, that you would let us know that this time is important, that this time is short and shortening, and that, God, the task at hand needs to quickly happen because we don't have much more time to see it happen. God, put an urgency in our hearts for our loved ones, for our friends, for our family, for those we work with, those we do life with. God, let it be a difference, God, that you make in us and through us. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. I also want to ask this today. I, would, I never close a service. It's not because we have new faces, but I never close a service without asking this. If you've been here a while, you know this. Uh, online, in the house, is there anyone here today or online that would say, Pastor, I don't know Jesus the way that you're preaching him, but I want to know him. I want to have that life with him. I'm not asking you to join our church. I'm not asking you to ever even come back. What I'm saying is join the family of God. God wants to have a personal relationship with you, not a religious relationship. And so, please, if you don't know him today, today's the day of salvation. Please open your life to the Lord. If there's anybody, you can raise your hand here or at home if you'd like to, Albert, praise God, or at home if you'd, Albert, if you're at home, you, uh, you'd like to say, stand. We can't see you, but stand and we're going to get to you in a minute. Brothers, I'm going to ask you to come forward today. Is there anybody else today that would like to join them today for the prayer of salvation? Just to say, Jesus, I need to get by myself and I need to commit myself to you. I know for these men, this is a recommitting. So this isn't their first time. This is a recommitting to God. And that's good. We need to do that. Is there anyone else that would like to join us to say, Pastor, pray with me today. I want to make sure that I'm right with the Lord. Amen. Praise God. Those online, would you stand where you're at? We're going to believe for you today. And we're going to ask you to have, we're going to ask the Lord to have his way in you too. And so would everybody join me today in this prayer? Anthony, you coming forward today? Praise God. Come on up, brother. Amen. Praise the Lord. We don't always get a lot of men. Right? It's usually women that respond to the spiritual things. But thank God for three men today that are responding to the things of the Lord because I think their lives are going to change today. I believe that with all my heart. Amen? And those online as well. Would everybody pray this with me, especially you three, and mean this with me today? Dear Jesus, I thank you today for dying on the cross for my sin. Today, I open my heart to you because I believe that everything you have done is just what I need and it will cover everything I've done. Come into my life. Be my Lord and my Savior. I give my life to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you reach your hands toward these brothers today and to anybody who might have stood online today? Father, right now I just commit uh, these ones to you, God. I thank you for them. I thank you for where you have brought them and how you brought them through today, that, God, they're standing here as a testimony to who, what you do and, and how you can do it. And so, Lord, I just ask that you would bless them. I ask that you would make this real today. I pray that this prayer would not be something that they just pray, just words, but it would be the things from the bottom of their hearts. It would be a statement of who they are and what they're believing in, God. Lord, I ask that you would do this in them, uh, help them in their lives, walk them through the things that they're facing, and God, bring them through the things that they're facing with a testimony, God. My God is good, and he's able to do. And so, God, we appreciate that today, and just commit them into your hands in Jesus' name. Amen.
Praise God. Good to see, see you, brother. I want to see you can pray for my daughter. Jonathan. Yes. Yes, we will. Yes. Amen. Why don't you stay here? I said Gabriella. That's not right. What's her name? Diana Medina. Diana. Yeah. Okay. I know her. I just, I got, I had the wrong name. Would you reach your hands toward these two young men? Uh, it's Albert's daughter and Albert's uh, sister that we want to pray for. There's some things going on in her life, some darkness that has entered in, and God wants to, uh, how many know God wants to set her free today? Amen. Amen. Diana or Gianna? Gianna. Gianna. Tiana. Tiana. Yes. Father, today, Lord, as we lay hands on this father and brother today, God, who are here today believing that you have a plan in this family and in this life, and we know that you have, God, because we know some things that you've already done, God, and we give you a great praise for that today, Jesus. We speak to Tiana, Father, Lord. We don't know what she's gotten into. We don't know the things, but Lord, we know that you care for her, you love her, and you want to reach out to her today. And so, Lord, we pray that your light would dispel the darkness, God. And we pray, God, that you would show her your love and your mercy, Father, that you would set her free today, God, and that you would do a great and mighty work in her life, Father, Lord. Father, Lord, in this father's heart, teach him how to pray. Teach him how to pray against the things that are coming against his daughter. Teach him how to raise up a standard in that household, God, of your word and of your things, God. And I just pray, God, that he, as he and his wife come together in this, Lord, that you're going to do a great and mighty work in that family, God. Lord, we're going to hear a great testimony of what you have done in the way that you've done it. And so, Holy Spirit, do your work. We thank you for it, and we ask it to be done today in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Praise God. Praise the Lord. And Anthony, I just had a sense that this was going to be you today. I didn't know that for sure, but praise the Lord. Who knows what God's up to? Amen. Great day in Jesus. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Amen. I'm going to ask your liberty in something today. Don't ask this much. Kim and I need to be on the road today. We've got a very long distance to travel today. Uh, we are going to finish up. We are going to finish up our vacation, and so uh, we're headed south again. Imagine that. Uh, but this is our vacation now. We've done it with the grandchildren. We've done it with the nieces and the nephews, and uh, so we, we need to get. We need to put some mileage on today. So I'm going to ask you that you allow me to leave. Uh, I won't be able to greet you. I apologize for that, Pastor Rick. If you'd lock up. And uh, you can always call me, you know, if I'm on a ride or something, I'll call you as soon as I get off. Uh, just because I'm on vacation doesn't mean I'm out of touch. All right, I want you to know that. And uh, we canceled our cruise uh, because of just some things that are going on. Uh, we booked that to next week, to next year. So, uh, so this is a vacation that we were able to fill in. So uh, we love you, and, uh, but I'm just going to skip out if that's okay. And uh, drive, 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 drive. That's what I'm going to do. So amen. God bless you. We love you. Uh, have a great day in Jesus. And uh, if you need prayer for anything, Pastor Rick's here. There's some Mercia's here. There's a lot of other people that could pray for you, Mary Lee and those here. So just, uh, they, seek them out, and they'll pray with you today. God bless you. Love you. Uh, men's group, not tomorrow night. Next Monday, okay, because I'll be back. So next Monday night, and uh, we're going to have a great time together. And uh, praise God. Have a great week. We love you. Amen.